Oh, come on. Robert? Oh. Robert? Hello. Hello, I can hear you there. Um, Edith? Yeah, let me just change my name to. Okay, it's okay, I recognize your face. <laughs> yes, I'm here. Okay, good. I was getting worried there was nobody here and it's like five minutes to four, so I, yeah. just, I just sent the email again to make sure people are, um, are finding this uh, room okay. <clears throat> so thanks for being here and just give me a few minutes while people gather up. Yep. Did you hear that graduation was postponed? I did, I did. I am not surprised. <laughs> but I wonder if that means that they're not gonna have the rest of the classes either then. Um, yeah, I don't know. Back on April 26th. Yeah. Can you guys uh, read what is on the on this board behind me? Okay. Oh, I gotta shift. Yes. It. Now, now I can. Now you can. Okay. Yeah. Great. Great. <clears throat> huh? Some people are having trouble getting into this room i feel like let me just see oh no there we go hey everybody hi dr Annan. Hi, good to see you guys, even if it's through a computer. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of people logging on right now. Wait, Dr. Annan, do you want us to keep our um, speakers muted or? Um, 
I'll talk about that once we get started. Uh, I can actually mute everybody with right. the click of a button. So I wish I had that kind of power all the time in my life, but <laughs> <laughs> just like shut everybody up anytime I want. But, um, but at least for this purpose, I can do that. But um, I'll tell you in a minute, once everybody gets here, kind of what I hope will be the best way to handle this. Make sure you can read my um, whiteboard okay for now. This is, uh, this is where I'm hoping to do my, um, my lecture from. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just reorganize my notes over here on the side for a second. And then we're going to get started. Let's see. I have about 12 people here so far. There's Tanya, Tuan, Amanda, Austin, Edith, Jocelyn, Michelle, Tanya, Vanessa. Awesome. All right, just hang tight guys. I'm gonna wait a couple more minutes. Um, just make sure you can hear me okay and that you can see what's on my whiteboard back there. I'm gonna extend the homework deadline and I'm gonna explain why uh, once we start. <clears throat> Hello. Hi. Is this Day? Yeah, this is Day. Great. Good to see you. Can you see Who me? You? And, can you see me? And can you see the board behind me? That's the first question. Yes, I can see everything. Great. Uh, I've got 16 people here so far. We're supposed to have 28 in the class, so I'm going to wait. Can we hear each? Can we hear the other students or just me? Yeah, we can hear you. I, I think everybody can hear everybody. I mean, at some point, I'm going to probably start muting everybody, but not yet. I'm not worried about that quite. <clears throat> People are finding their way over here. <clears throat> OK. <clears throat> uh, if you have uh, uh, headphones that you can wear, uh, that is definitely a nice option. Um, if you don't have headphones, I probably fairly soon am going to ask you to mute your microphone. Um, but that's just to kind of keep some of the background noise from interfering with our chance to talk here. Well, people are showing up right on cue here, up to 20. If anybody cannot hear me okay, then be sure to let me know and we can see what technology adjustments we need to make. Um, most of you, I can see your uh, video. Some of you, uh, maybe you have an option to, to put your video on. Um, it's kind of up to you. I can only see like a fraction of all of you at one time anyway on my little scroll bar. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but it is nice to see faces sometimes. I was teaching my other class earlier today and it was really nice to see people like nodding and thumbs up and thumbs down and stuff like that. Um, you know, anything we can do to simplify the communication. So.
All right, and maybe I'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'll start talking. It's going to take me a little bit of time to just kind of uh, explain some logistical things before we can actually uh, do any math today. So uh, it's great to see all of you. Um, I hope that you're all being safe, taking good care of yourself, washing your hands a lot, and um, you know, doing what you can to sort of help help out with this. Uh, very strange times that we're living in right now. Uh, for my part, um, you know, when I was in Fullerton, I, uh, I lived in an apartment and I shared a place with three other people that uh, each go their own separate directions. And um, I live in a pretty small place there. I decided uh, because I figured this was gonna be an extended time away that I would relocate. So I am actually coming to you from uh, Colorado. I drove 17 hours yesterday. I, I got to my house at three in the morning and I went to sleep for like four hours and then I got up and started getting unpacked and getting ready for today because Tuesday is a busy day for me with all of my classes. Uh, so if I look a little tired uh, or seem a little less uh, organized than normal, uh, please try to bear with me. Uh, it has been a, a big adjustment for me as well. Um, but now that I'm here, I'll be able to uh, stay a little bit more isolated. And also uh, I should start getting some more rest and, and get, get into the flow of things. Um, so a couple of quick announcements uh, as we get started today. Um, first of all, uh, if you have not communicated with me yet about what, what you're planning to write your term paper about and or who you're going to work with on that paper. Um, please try to do that as soon as you can. I know that I had originally given you a deadline, uh, which I've been a little bit loose with uh, because of all this craziness. Um, but I would love to, to hear from you what, what you're planning to do for your, uh, for your term paper. Um, secondly, you've been getting a number of emails from, <coughs> excuse me, from me um, through my faculty center. Uh, so it may sound, it may look like it's coming from the desk of Scott Annan rather than uh, just a direct email from me. That's because I'm trying to send mass messages. Um, in some cases, I know at least one student who some of those messages were going to their spam folder. So I want to advise everybody to please be checking your emails and checking your spam folders to make sure that you're actually getting all of the announcements and messages uh, that I'm trying to share with you. Um, I don't want anything to get lost along the way. Um, yesterday, I also, um, well, while I was traveling, <laughs> I took a break and I, I sent you all a folder invite to Dropbox to submit your homework in, but I put the wrong date on it. I put uh, March 18th, uh, which is tomorrow's date. Uh, now, we were supposed to have homework due today, uh, but I am going to let you work on it until Thursday. Um, one of the reasons for that is I'm simply overwhelmed right now with emails. Uh, trying to keep up. Uh, and I've got several of you that have sent me some emails with questions about homework. And um, I just haven't had a chance to get back to you yet. And I don't know that I can get back to you fast enough to kind of allow you to get this done in the next few hours. So I'm going to let you work on it until Thursday. Um, there's another reason that I'm going to let you work on it until Thursday. And this is going to sound really strange. I don't know the reason for this but the university will not allow me to give a virtual lecture this Thursday or next Tuesday. Um, at part of the whole package deal with this moving to online teaching, and maybe it comes through the faculty union, I'm not quite sure what the reason is, but they are like forbidding us from actually teaching material uh, because they want everybody, that's faculty, staff, students, they want everybody to have time to adjust to this um, period of time where we are, um, you know, transitioning and people are having issues with technology and everything else. Um, 
By the way, right now I have all of you muted. So if you're trying to talk to me, uh, just hang tight. I will unmute you in a minute to see if you want to ask me a question. Um, but I just want to get some things said first before I take questions. Um, so anyway, they're not going to allow me to like give a virtual lecture on new material on Thursday or next Tuesday. So what I'm going to do, they have said that I can have an office hour on Thursday, as long as whatever I do on Thursday is stuff that you wouldn't be required to attend. So here's what I'm going to do, guys. I am going to be here on Thursday at this exact same uh, Zoom meeting ID link number uh, at exactly four o'clock. And I'm going to have a slightly less formal class on Thursday where I'm going to do um, a couple of different things. I'm going to answer questions about this homework assignment because there have been several. And so if I give you a couple more days, then we can talk about it on Thursday. We'll have plenty of time on Thursday for that. Um, also, I'm going, to do so, I'm going to go through at least one and maybe two group works with you on Thursday. The, the group work number six that I kept saying you guys should work out on your own, it's so important and the problems are so useful, I think, that I really do want to do them. And this will give me a chance to do that without getting into trouble. Because as I said, I, I'm allowed to do stuff that you, like if you can't come on Thursday, you can still read the solutions to the group work. But I'm gonna be here Thursday and we're gonna talk through them together and work through them um, at that time. I'm also going to uh, maybe make another group work. Uh, so we might have a couple of different group works. So I hope that that is clear. The folder that I invited you to has the wrong date on it, but that's the folder I want you to use um, for homework number eight. So you can turn that in any time between now and uh, Thursday night, okay? Um, let me see, uh, I'm gonna go ahead, let me see, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute everybody right now. Um, but of course, if you have muted yourself, that shouldn't matter, like it should still be that, so I just unmuted everybody, uh, but most of you are showing like a microphone that's turned off. If your microphone is turned on, uh, that's okay as long as you're wearing headphones or if you want to say something to me. Uh, keep in mind, I cannot see all of your faces at one time. So, uh, you know, raising your hand like you normally would isn't really going to work. Uh, you just need to speak up and uh, you can unmute yourself and say, hey, Dr. Anna. And you might even want to identify yourself. A lot of people have sort of similar sounding voices. So you can say, hey, Dr. Anna, and this is Michelle or, or whoever it is. And then uh, we can go from there and I can answer your question. Um, yeah, the, the, the main thing I don't want is to have, like if there's a lot of background noise wherever your location is, um, I definitely would rather have you stay on headphones for that or else um, stay muted unless you actually wanna say something to me. So I hope that that all makes sense uh, so far. I have, I have not yet put up a new homework assignment. Uh, I'm gonna do that. It's gonna be due probably next week on Thursday. Again, I can't do anything next week on Tuesday that's like official. So uh, I'll probably shift that to Thursday. And then the week after that, we have our spring break. Um, so that's kind of where we're at. Um, well, this is great. I've got 25 people here. That's almost everybody in the class. Um, probably better than my regular attendance. <laughs> um, who knows? But uh, anyway, I'm glad to have you all here. I apologize, my voice is a little bit shot. Um, I haven't gotten much sleep lately and I've been talking a lot to, uh, to various people, so it's been a bit of a challenge. But um, does anybody have any questions about what I've just gone over regarding things like uh, the Zoom sessions, the, the logistics and, and the, the homework deadline that I've changed to Thursday? Any questions at all? Hey, Dr. Annan? Yes. Um, it's Tuan. Tuan. There, there's like a chat box kind of underneath, and Eric was asking if the Thursday Zoom session is going to be recorded. Oh, you know, I don't know why I don't see that chat box because um, it's weird because I saw it in my early, oh, wait, there it is. I see it now. Let me pull that up so I can see more clearly. And I've got somebody else trying to enter the room too. 
So we're up to 26 people now. Ah, yes, I see that Zoom group chat. Uh, I'll try to keep looking at that, but I, in my earlier class, I sort of missed a few notes and people had to, had to let me know. So thank you, Tuan, for doing that. Um, yes, I will be recording these, all of these sessions. That's a great question. So as we are meeting, I'm also recording these sessions and I'll be posting those videos onto my, um, my regular website. So I'm still gonna be using that website, of course, to give you homework assignments, um, to post videos um, later on in April. If we're still working remotely, when we get closer to a midterm, I'll put everything up there. So you're gonna to need to use both the Zoom as well as the, the website to kind of do everything. Great, uh, are there any other questions before we uh, try to get started here today? I have a question, actually. Yes, go ahead, Matt. Uh, so is it across the entire university now that we're extending the mandatory non-instructional days? So the March 19th to the 24th, you said? Yes, yes, that is a, that is a across the whole university. Um, we just got notice of that today, and that's why I decided to change your homework deadline to Thursday, um, so that I can use Thursday as a virtual office hour to answer questions about that homework. Yeah. Is that clear? Sorry, I didn't catch that. Was somebody trying to ask me something? Okay, maybe not. Okay, I think I think we're good. Does anybody else have any questions before we get get going here? Okay, thanks guys for bearing with with this, um, with all this Zoom stuff and all the emails and everything. Hopefully, this will start going a little more smoothly once we get uh, more comfortable with it. So I'm going to step up to the to the board now. And um, this is my whiteboard that I just drove all the way uh, here from uh, Southern California that I'm going to try to do uh, my lectures on. And again, if I start writing off the side of the screen somewhere and you can't see what I've written, um, let me know. Uh, speak up if you can't hear me or if you can't see what I'm writing at any point. Uh, that's totally, totally what I want you to do. Okay. Um, I am just going to, for now, uh, say one last thing about CELO theory, uh, and then we're going to be all done with this. The one thing that I didn't get around to, well, actually, before I do that, um, there is a video that I just made a couple of days ago, right before I left California, called uh, Simple Group Killer. <laughs> That is not an official name and you should not use that name in, in like a, any sort of a formal writing. If you were gonna do a term paper, I don't wanna see this in the term paper, but this is just so we all know what I'm, what I'm talking about. Um, it's about a 20 minute video that I made and I think it'll be uh, great for you guys to watch it. I have a proof of it uh, in that YouTube video and uh, please go through and watch it and I have an example at the end of how to use that result. So that's something um, that I am definitely wanting to, to have, you, have you watch. It's not stated as a theorem in the book. It's actually just an exercise in uh, chapter nine, I believe. So um, in the video, I specifically cite where it is in Hungerford's book. Uh, but anyway, that's something to watch. And then the other thing that I, I wanted to wrap up was that I never did- Dr. Innan? Yes. Uh, Mandy got kicked out of the uh, the Zoom session, and she asked if you could. Oh, hear yeah, I see. I see that right there. Thank you for letting me know that. I don't know how that happened. Okay. Oh, she should be back in now. Yeah, I'm good. Okay. Thank you. Yep, you bet. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the other thing, I never actually did state all of the CELO theorems for you. I got so excited about the third one that I never did state the first two CELO theorems. So I want to take just a second and uh, tell you what the other two CELO theorems say. Um, so the first CELO theorem, the third one is the, is, the, is the most fun one. It's the one that you get to do all the applications with. But the first CELO theorem says the following. If there is a prime P, that divides the size of the group G, then G has a subgroup 
G has a subgroup of size P to the K, right? Um, for all K, this would be for all positive integers K, for all positive integers K, uh, such that P to the K divides the order of the group. Okay, so I'll let everybody kind of digest that with me. If we have a prime that divides the size of our group, then this is telling us that G will have subgroups of all prime power sizes that lead up to the biggest power of P that divides the size of G. Let me just give you a quick example of that. So as a quick example of this uh, first CELO theorem, uh, let's suppose, let's suppose that the size of G is uh, three, well, let me write it as a number first and then I'll, let's do uh, 8,100. Okay, just something like that, 8,100. Okay, and uh, let's just think about a prime that divides that. So I'm just gonna pick one in particular that's st staring us in the face, which is the prime three. So three is definitely a prime that divides uh, the size of the group. So what this first CELO theorem says, okay, so let me just note here that three does divide 8,100. So this just says that G will have a subgroup of every power of three up to the largest power of three that divides the group. So um, the first CELO theorem implies G has subgroups, has at least one subgroup, right? It ha there exists a subgroup of sizes 3, 9, 27, and 81. Can everybody see that okay over there? Let me tip that down a little bit better. There we go. Okay, so uh, these are just the different powers of three that divide into uh, the size of the group. Of course, you guys remember, I'm sure, maybe somebody who's not muted uh, want to tell me, uh, what is the name for a subgroup, in this case, that has size 81? What would we call that subgroup? A P subgroup? Uh, it's a it's a CELO P subgroup, right? It's it's the largest power of P that divides into the group. So any subgroup of size 81 is a CELO 3 subgroup in this case. Any subgroup of size 81. So the first CELO theorem tells us that a CELO 3 subgroup must exist, right? But see, here's the thing. You remember the third CELO theorem? This one? n sub p equals one plus pk divides m. This is the third CELO theorem. Notice that n sub p is at least one, right? <laughs> so of course, the third CELO theorem already tells me, the third CELO theorem already tells me that there's at least a CELO p subgroup, that they exist. So, but this first CELO, uh, first CELO theorem does tell me that we have subgroups of all of those smaller powers of p as well all of those sizes that are smaller powers of P. Okay, so that's the first CELO theorem. Does anybody have any, any questions about that? Okay, let me write down the second CELO theorem. I'm gonna erase my example here. Again, the beauty of this is I am recording it, so if you're, somehow you didn't keep up on the writing, I'm gonna be posting this video later, um, but I'll, I'll try not to go too fast. I know there's a little bit of a lag time to kind of keep up with, with the internet and so on. So let me go ahead and write down the second CELO theorem. Okay, the second CELO theorem just says this. If P and Q, capital P and capital Q, if we have those two things, if those are two CELO, let's say P subgroups of G, come over here for a second. 
So if capital P and capital Q are two CeeLo P subgroups of G, then there exists an X in the group G such that, such that um, X inverse times capital P times X is equal to Q. Okay, hopefully that, that is coming through on the transmission all right. Um, let me just say what that's really telling us. You have, a, you have two subgroups that are both CeeLo P subgroups. So of course that means, that means that they have the same size. But what this is saying is more than that. This is saying that these two CeeLo P subgroups not only have the same size, they are actually conjugates of each other. In other words, I can take all of the elements from one of the CeeLo P subgroups and find an X in the group to conjugate it by to get the other one. And that actually has a consequence that, it, so, so in other words, these aren't just two subgroups of the same size that have nothing to do with each other, right? We have two subgroups of size 81 in our group of size 8,100. That's great, but are they related at all? This is saying, yes, they are. All CeeLo subgroups are conjugate to one another. I can take one of the CeeLo subgroups and find an X and conjugate it into another one. Okay, this is what this is saying. Um, now, the, the other thing I want to point out here is that this actually implies that P is isomorphic to Q. Now, that's not normally stated as part of the CeeLo theorem, but what this is saying is that these sub, I mean, these are subgroups, right? So they are groups in their own right. Dr. Hannon? Yeah. Time out. Uh, Amanda, Amanda just said that she got disconnected again. Huh, that is very strange. I, I, I added her back in. <laughs> oh, but she got disconnected again. Something about her Wi-Fi. Oh, oh please I fix. Sorry. Oh, there she is. I'm back. Thank you. Okay, no problem. It looks like I got everybody here. All right, great. Um, so what I was just saying is that if we have two CeeLo P subgroups, they not only have the same size, they're actually, they're actually isomorphic and we can actually do a conjugation from one to the other. And so, you know, for example, if, uh, I don't know, what if our CeeLo subgroup has size eight and one of our CeeLo eight, uh, one of our CeeLo two subgroups is D4. Then what this theorem implies is that all of our CeeLo two subgroups are isomorphic to D4. Okay, so, um, that, that's um, more or less the, the upshot of this CeeLo theorem. So on, on Thursday during this optional um, class where I'm gonna do some virtual office hours, uh, I'm gonna do a group work with you and we're going to actually try to figure out the isomorphism type of some of these um, CeeLo P subgroups. We, know it's, we now know that it's unique, right? All CeeLo, P subgroups of G for a given group G are isomorphic to each other. Okay, so that's, that's the point of what this, this theorem is saying. Okay, but again, there's not much else to say about it. Uh, the first two CeeLo theorems are not nearly as practical in terms of how they get used as the third one, which we talked a lot about uh, in, our, in our classes last week. Does anybody have any questions about this? Okay, if not, we're gonna completely change gears. <laughs> I'm gonna erase this and we're gonna, we're gonna start something else. I have to be real careful when I'm erasing this board, so I'm sorry it takes me a little bit of time, um, <laughs> but I just wanna do it real carefully. Um, so, Here's the thing, uh, we've done about as much group theory at this point as I would like to do. I'm gonna move on and talk uh, about ring theory next. And I'm hoping that I'll be doing 
a bit more than what you may have seen in 302. We will be coming back to the group theory, however, at the end of the semester when we um, combine it with field theory to develop this amazing um, relationship between groups and fields, which is known as Galois theory. So the group theory is not going away. Uh, we're just taking a, a break uh, for right now, and we're going to do some ring theory. So this is actually going backwards in our book to chapter three. So I'm going to put some ring theory up here. Did some of you get some basic ring theory in Math 302? Did they did they do that at all, or is that I don't I don't know. It depends on who you took it with exactly what they covered. Um, I'm going to go ahead and um, sort of take it more or less from, from the top, especially since we're trying to work remotely here. But we will be going faster through this than we did through groups. I'm, I'm not going to be spending uh, the same kind of time on this, uh, but what, I definitely have some things I want to say about, about ring theory. So let me put the definition of a ring on the board. Okay, This is what your homework assignment number nine will be will be about as well. So I'm going to put a definition here. Um, so here we go. A ring is the following thing. It is a set. I'll call it R. A ring is a set R with two operations. Let me just make sure I'm not standing. <laughs> It's a set with, with two operations. Those are usually written as a plus and a times, okay, such that okay, so first thing is under addition, if we just focus on the addition only and we ignore the, the multiplication operation, uh, this is an abelian group. So under addition, we have an abelian group. So it's kind of nice that we use a plus sign for that because usually in group theory, for abelian structures, we like to use um, a plus. All right. The second condition is that if A and B are elements of the ring R, then A times B is an element of R. And as you can see, I'm already dropping the dot uh, I'm not writing the dot between the A and the B. Uh, so A times B is an element of the ring. Uh, the third one is that if A, B, and C are elements of R, then A, B times C is the same as A times B, C. This is the, uh, the usual associative law. And uh, finally, we have the distributive laws. So if A, B, and C are elements of R, then it's actually, there's actually two equations I want to write down here. Uh, the first one is that if you take the quantity A plus B and multiply by C, we get AC plus BC. And Secondly, if we start with A on the left and multiply it by the quantity B plus C, we get AB plus AC. Okay, so we have distributive laws, associative laws, um, all of that's pretty standard stuff. Um, I don't think anything probably would be surprising to you here. Um, there is no requirement that the ring be commutative under multiplication. Under addition, we have to have an abelian group, but under multiplication, not necessarily. So I'm gonna add that as an extra down here. So if in addition, if in addition, AB equals BA for all AB in the ring, we call R a commutative ring.
So a commutative ring just means that when you multiply the elements in either order, uh, you get the same result. Can anybody think of an example of, so, uh, so let's start, we're gonna write down some examples in a second. Um, can anybody think of a good example of a non-commutative ring that you might know? Where you can do addition and you matrix can do matrix under multiplication. Pardon me, Austin? A matrix use under multiplication, like regular. Exactly. Matrix multiplication is a great example of a place where you do not have commutativity. So uh, let me write that down as an example here at the bottom. So for example, I'm going to use this notation, Mn of of R, I guess I'll, I'll write it that way for now. If I think of that, and I'm actually going to use a notation that we've seen before. I'm going to put a little angle brackets here, and then I'm going to put a plus and a times. This is just square matrices of size n by n with regular addition and multiplication. That is a non-commutative ring. Right, so Definitely matrices don't commute. Okay. Um, so hopefully, hopefully that makes, uh, makes some sense. Now there are also some optional properties. Um, you might be wondering whether the elements in the ring have to have an identity element under multiplication. It's not required. Um, or whether elements have to have inverses under multiplication. And that's also not required. So the addition structure is pretty rigid. Under addition, you have to have a group. So you're gonna have a, an identity element, everybody's gonna have an inverse, right? The, all the axioms of a group have to be satisfied. Under multiplication, everything is pretty much optional except for what? Closure, associative, and distributive laws. Right, so everything else is kind of optional. Let me, um, let me, I've run out of room already. I'm gonna erase, um, I think I'm just gonna go ahead and erase this definition. Does anybody need me to keep this up here for another minute or two, or do you, have you guys had a chance to kind of get it written down? It's kind of a long definition. Dr. Annan? Yes. Hi, it's Noe. Um, so the first property, that would be a Boolean under addition, right? Right, the, the part A up here is, that under addition, the ring has to be um, commutative and uh, commutative. In other words, it's an abelian group under addition. Okay, thank you. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, great. Anybody else have any questions yet? I'm gonna go ahead and erase this definition, even though we definitely need to know it since we're talking about rings now. But under multiplication, there are not a lot of things that are required, so we can add them as extras. So let me put this uh, into the notes here. These are what I would call optional properties. Optional properties. So uh, the first one is, if there exists, uh, I'm gonna write this as a one with a sub R on it. <laughs> Um, if there exists a one sub R, which is an element of the ring, right, such that X times one sub R equals one sub R times X equals X for all X in the ring, then we call R a ring with identity. Okay, so every ring has to have an identity, sorry, every ring has to have an identity under addition, which we usually call zero. But this is saying that we might have an identity under multiplication as well, and that would be called one. So we have a zero and a one, and um, this is for a ring with identity. Uh, in addition, the second optional property is that if, whoops, sorry, if 
for every a not equal to zero in R, there exists a B in R such that AB equals BA equals one, then R is a field. A field, um, I'm sorry, if for every, then R is, sorry, then R is a, sorry, I'm gonna give this a slightly different name. In this case, R is called a division ring. And then, sorry, one, one more thing. Um, I'll just leave this under number two as well. A commutative division ring is a field. A commutative division ring is a field. So if everybody is multiplicatively invertible, other than zero, of course, zero will never have an inverse. But if everybody else is, is um, if everybody else has a multiplicative inverse, then we have a division ring. And if it's also commutative, then we have a field in that case. Okay, so there's a few definitions here to keep track of. You can't have a division ring unless you have an identity, obviously, because you see the one is right here. So um, it is required that this be a ring with identity. And then in that case, you could have um, potentially a division ring if everything is multiplicatively invertible. And if it's also commutative, then it's a field. Let's write down some examples so we can kind of start getting the hang of this here. So I'll put some examples here. Okay, so the first one, um, well, I'm gonna write down a whole bunch of examples at once here. If you take Z or Q or R or the complex numbers or even Z sub N, if you take any of those examples, integers, rational numbers, real numbers, complex numbers, integers modulo N, these are all rings. And in fact, these are all commutative rings. These are commutative rings with identity. These are commutative rings with identity, exactly. So um, they all have a one. They all have um, commutativity under multiplication. The distributive laws, the associative laws, I know I'm getting cut off the screen. The problem is if I stand, if I push that laptop back, you won't be able to read the screen. Is everybody able to read my screen? So far so good? Yes. Yeah, let me know, let me know if it's not clear, but uh, I'm trying to write fairly big <laughs> as best I can. Yeah, so anyway, um, that right there is a whole big laundry list of rings. Now, uh, I already mentioned a moment ago that if we go to matrix rings, so if you take, say, n by n matrices um, over the real numbers, for example, this is a non-commutative ring. This is a non-commutative ring. This is just matrices. Um, n by n, obviously n has to be at least two for that to, to be non-commutative. Um, a third example, and I really like this example, uh, and it's actually also a whole big family of examples again, is we can take anything from the uh, first list and turn, turn them into polynomials. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna make a ring out of Z of X uh, and Q of X, R of X, right? All of these, C of X. And the next one, the last one over here is gonna be Z sub N of X. So um, these are just going to be algebraic structures where you're talking about polynomials. 
And you can obviously multiply two polynomials and get another polynomial. Uh, polynomials are distributive, associative, and so on and so forth, right? So those are great examples of rings. You can do addition, subtraction, multiplication. Um, so anything of that, of that nature would work. Can anybody think of, a, of an example of a ring without identity? A ring without an identity element. Now, when I say that, of course, I'm talking about no multiplicative identity element. We definitely have to have zero, which is the additive identity element. What do you guys think? Think of a ring that doesn't have one in it. How about we just take uh, something like the even integers? Would that work? 2z. This is all even, all even numbers. Can you guys see the bottom there? All even uh, integers. Under addition, that's definitely a group. The identity element is zero. And the inverse of each even number is just the negative of that number, which is still even. So this is a group under addition. It's abelian. Uh, it's certainly under multiplication. It's going to be associative. It's going to be distributive. But there's no multiplicative identity element, is there? This is a ring without identity. Okay, so this is a ring. It's a commutative ring, but I'm just going to say a ring for now. This is a ring without identity. Okay, so. Um, Dr. Annan. Yes, question. Sorry, to go back to number three, you wrote down like z of x cube, like what are, is that a ring, uh, same thing as number one, commutative ring with identity? Or what oh, would you yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, so, so, so all of those polynomial rings, these are commutative rings. Thank you for allow, allowing me to go back and add that. These are commutative rings with identity. Sometimes you can just write commutative rings with one. Make sure that that came through on the corner of my board there. Yeah, so those are all commutative rings with one, definitely. Okay. Um, does that make sense so far, guys? We are mostly going to be working with commutative rings, um, and we are mostly going to be working with rings that have one. So it's not normally going to be uh, too big of an issue. Okay, so we, we have rings with identity, um, and we often will be working with commutative rings. So this, this notion of a division ring is not going to come up a lot in this course. It tends to be talked about more at the graduate level in algebra courses. Uh, we're going to be focusing more on fields, um, which are commutative division rings. So there's some examples. What are some examples of uh, fields? We should give a few of those as well. Let me turn this up to the top again so everybody can see it. Examples of fields So now these are going to be rings that have the property that they have to have a multiplicative identity and every non-zero element has to be invertible under multiplication. Are any of the examples in one through four, are any of those going to be fields? One. Is Z a field? Does every number have a multiplicative inverse? No, because zero. Oh, uh, no. Well, forget about, forget about zero, guys. Zero is not, we, we don't ever talk about zero here. So <laughs> it, it's just the non-zero elements. Are there, does every non-zero element have a multiplicative inverse? Yeah. Oh, wait, for in, in the two, right? Yeah. yeah. So, no, so right? For example, what's the inverse of three? <clears throat> One third. That's not an integer. And that's not an integer, right? So Z is not a field. But what about, uh, what about Q? Is that a field? That's a field. 
that's a field for sure, right? So Q certainly works, right? Mm -hmm. Every non-zero rational number has a, has a multiplicative inverse, which is just its reciprocal. The real numbers would certainly work. The complex numbers, all of those examples are certainly, are certainly going to be fields. Um, that's about it on this list. We have, uh, isn't ZP a field? So if yes, it is I'm going to get to that one in just a second, but I'm kind of looking at some of these other ones. The matrices are non-commutative, so that's not a field. What about these polynomials? Are those going to form a field? Any of these going to be fields? You know, can I take the multiplicative inverse of you know three x plus five, for example? Does that have an inverse? Well, the multiplicative inverse of that would be one over three x plus five. But the question is, is that a polynomial? Mm. That's not a polynomial, right? That's that's what what they would call it. Sort of the high school algebra course, they would call that a rational function, right? It's a fraction of polynomials. So polynomials are very bad uh, with respect to multiplicative inverses. So none of the polynomials in example three are going to work. Obviously, 2z doesn't even have an identity element, so that's not going to be a field. So there's just one more example of a field that I want to sh show you. But as you can see, our list is getting pretty thin here. We don't have uh, too many examples of fields. So let me um, give you this little uh, fact, and we'll actually try and prove this fact, I think. So here's a fact. Under what circumstances would Zn so this is integers modulo n. Under what circumstances would that be a field? Does anybody have a, a conjecture or a, a gut feeling? When would when, when n is prime. prime? Oh, you guys already know this. Yes, when n is prime. That's exactly right. Um, so that is an if and only if characterization. So if, if you're looking at a prime number, then you're definitely going to have a field there. Why don't I take a minute and write down the proof of that? I think that might be uh, kind of a useful thing to, to do. Is this all kind of mostly review so far? I mean, I, I'm not sure if this was covered in 302 recently, or is this too slow, too fast, about right? What do you guys think? I think okay. it's pretty good. Decent for now? Okay, great. Okay, so let me try and prove this uh, fact. So proof, this is an if and only if, so I have to go both directions. I'm going to start by proving from right to left. So let's assume that, I'm going to call it P now, let's assume P is prime. And I'm going to try to show that Zn is a field. Of course, it's already a commutative ring with identity, right? So all we really have to show is that every non-zero number has an inverse, right? So let's see if we can't uh, do that. So let, I'll just call it k, be an element, oh sorry, k not equal to zero in zp. So I'm going to take a, a non-zero element of zp and I'm going to try to show that it uh, has an inverse, okay? So uh, we can assume because we're working in ZP, we can assume, therefore, that K is, you know, somewhere between 1 and P minus 1. It's not equal to 0 in ZP, so it would have to be limited to that uh, interval of numbers, okay? Um, now, here's the thing. Because P is prime, do you guys agree that K and P are relatively prime to each other? So note, I'll just write this down. The GCD of K and P is equal to one. They have no common factors. Because P is prime, the only factors of P are one and P, and K is, you know, um, it's at most p minus one. Okay, so do you guys remember the Euclidean algorithm? I think I talked about this briefly at one point earlier in the semester. 
that you can take the GCD of two numbers and write it as an integer combination of those two numbers. Yeah, so we did talk about that. We used it actually in one of the homework problems. So we can find, I'm gonna just say it this way, there exist, there exist integers A and B, these are elements of the integers, with, with Ka plus Pb equal to one. This is this magic equation that comes out of the Euclidean algorithm, okay? So we have, we have that. Now uh, in ZP, in the, in the ring ZP, this reads, okay, so guys, remember in ZP, what is P equivalent to? So if I'm in ZP. Zero, it's equivalent to zero. Yeah, it's equivalent to zero, right? In ZP, P is the same as zero, so I can actually cross this off and I can just say Ka is, I'm just gonna use the congruence uh, notation. Ka is congruent to one in mod P. But that's telling me basically that A is the inverse of K. Okay, so that's exactly what we needed to show. So this implies that A is the inverse a is the inverse of K in the field or in, in the uh, ring ZP and therefore ZP is a field. Okay, so thus ZP is a field. All right. <clears throat> Any questions on that part of the proof? So if n is a prime, then zn will be a field. I have to go reverse this, right? I have to go the, the opposite direction. So I'm gonna erase all of this in a second. Um, and I'm gonna to try to prove that if we had a field, then n is prime, but I'm gonna do it by way of contradiction, or I'm gonna do it, sorry, by way of contrapositive actually. So I'm gonna go ahead and give myself some more room to write. Sorry, I wish I had a bigger board. <laughs> That's the trouble with not being in McCarthy Hall right now. Okay, I'm gonna go forward, but I'm gonna assume that N is not prime. And that means that I can, of course, factor it into two smaller factors. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna write N as C times D where one is less than C comma D is less than N. So if N is not prime, then there's gotta be a way to kind of factor it like that. Is everything good? Yep. Okay, everybody's hearing me okay? All right, just making sure. Um, okay. Well, so the thing is that if n is not prime, I'm gonna to try to show that c and d do not have multiplicative inverses, right? So in zn, in zn, c times d is equivalent to zero, right? So c times d is equivalent to zero mod n. So if c, is, I'm gonna say, multiplicatively invertible, just to be really clear about that. We're talking about multiplicative inverses here. So if C is multiplicatively invertible, then all I have to do is multiply that equation by C inverse. So we get, so if C is multiplicatively invertible, we can take the C inverse times CD, which would be equivalent to C inverse times zero, which is equivalent to zero. This is, of course, mod n. And I can cancel the C inverse and the C. In other words, D is equivalent to zero mod n. And so, well, that's a contradiction. Because look where D look at the look at where D lives. D is some number between one and n, 
So it's certainly not congruent to zero mod n. So this is a contradiction. It contradicts the fact that d was supposed to be strictly between 1 and n. OK. OK, so therefore c is not multiplicatively invertible. <laughs> so zn is not a field. So there's your proof that uh, zn is a field if and only if um, n is a prime number. OK. So far, so good. Come back up here. So this is just a nice fact that is a useful thing to, to carry forward with us. Dr. Adam? Yeah. I was just going to say, we can give a quick uh, overview of the whole, well, I mean, of the forward direction. I didn't quite understand it fully. So if Zn is a, is a field, then n is prime, right? So the idea is that if you have a number that's not a prime, it will not be a field. Zn will not be a field. And the reason is that if n is not a prime, you can factor n. That's the way that proof works, right? You factor it as c times d, where c and d are you know, bigger than 1 but less than n. And both of those numbers, C and D, are going to fail to be multiplicatively invertible. And so therefore, if N is not a prime, ZN will not be a field. I'm going to give you a little better perspective on that. I'm even going to draw a picture of it in a minute that'll help give you kind of the big picture of what I just said, because I know it's a mouthful. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. So um, be before I go any further, I just want to put a couple more terms on the board. and. Then I'll come back and kind of elaborate on what I was just talking with Noe about. So a quick definition. Um, an element U in the ring R is a unit if it is multiplicatively invertible. So uh, when I talk about a unit in a ring, I'm just talking about an element that is, that is multiplicatively invertible. And uh, so for example, um, if F is a field, I'll call it capital F. If F is a field, every non-zero element is a unit. That's kind of the definition of a field. The definition of a field is that every non-zero element is a unit. Every non-zero element is multiplicatively invertible. Um, also, it's worth noting, I'll just call this a remark, the set of units, let me give that a notation, I'll call it U of R. If we just take those multiplicatively invertible elements, this set of units forms a group under multiplication. It forms a group under multiplication. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we've actually talked about some examples of this before, right? So just as a really easy example, you know, if you take the group of units of Z13, what is that going to be? Well, it's going to be, well, Z13 is a field, right? Z13 is a field, so every non-zero element is a unit. I'm gonna write that as Z13 star, which is really referring to all of the numbers from 1 through 12. And uh, so this is a group of size 12. 
Okay, so then we can go back to group theory and ask, well, what group of size 12 is it, <laughs> right? It's gonna be an abelian group of size 12. So we have a list of candidates and we can, we can further analyze things. It turns out that the group of units of ZP is always a cyclic group. This is a not quite such a trivial fact, but so in this case, these 12 numbers are forming a group that is isomorphic to Z12, but I want you to be careful here. I don't mean Z12 under addition. Well, th this is Z12 under addition, but these numbers one through 12 are being viewed under multiplication. We're taking the multiplicatively invertible elements out of Z13 and forming a group out of those. So, so there's just a, a quick example of, of uh, units. It's just the multiplicatively invertible elements of a ring. Maybe just one more example. Uh, the units of, oh, I don't know, the integers. If I want to know which integers are multiplicatively invertible, what would I, what would I get for the answer for that? Which integers are multiplicatively invertible? Just one. One and? Or zero. A negative one, right? Negative one, thank you, that's right. Plus or minus one, right? Plus or minus one, the, the positive one and negative one, these are the multiplicatively invertible elements, okay? Um, nothing else has a multiplicative inverse in the integers. Uh, but if I wanted to, to know, for example, what are the units of Q? Well, now you're talking about a field again. So every non-zero rational number would be a unit, so your group of units would be uh, Q star in that case. Okay. Um, so anytime you have a field, the group of units is just F star, right? So coming back up to this example, the group of units of any field would just be F star. Okay. Great, so we know what a unit is. Um, now I wanna talk about something that is almost like the opposite of that. And that is a zero divisor. And this is a really uh, important concept in ring theory, the definition of a zero divisor. So um, let R, be a commutative ring. We really don't talk about this for non-commutative rings. We'll take a commutative ring. Um, a zero divisor is an element, I'm gonna call it little a, which is not equal to zero. So it's a non-zero element such that there exists a B not equal to zero with A times B equals to zero. <laughs> this is where um, things get a little tricky because most of your life you've been working in rings that have had none of these zero divisors in them. In fact, um, as a, as a follow-up definition, we can talk about what is an integral domain. So I may as well just define that right now. Um, let R be a commutative ring. All right, let R be a commutative ring. Um, if R has no zero divisors, I'm just gonna write it like this, zero dash divisor, divisors. If R has no zero divisors, we call R an integral domain. So if there are no zero divisors, then 
what we have is called an integral domain. Um, so I think the best way to get a handle on, on units and their relationship with zero divisors is if I state a, um, a remark right away and try to convince you of this immediately. And it's this, an element cannot be both. It's impossible for an element to be both a zero divisor and a unit at the same time. So let me just put that down here. Um, a zero divisor cannot be a unit. A zero divisor simply cannot be a unit. Um, let me just write down a short proof of that for you guys real quick. Again, feel free to chime in if anybody's got any questions here. We've only got a few minutes left. I'm gonna try to try to get this in and draw a picture to, to wrap things up for today and then we'll call it good. Um, the proof is just this. Uh, suppose that, uh, suppose that let's say A is a unit and a zero divisor. Suppose you have something that's both a unit and a zero divisor on your hands. Well, what does that mean? Uh, well, it means that there exists a B not equal to zero with A times B equal to one. And at the same time, there exists a C not equal to zero with A times C equal to zero. So the first part, A times B equals to one, that's exp expressing the fact that A is a unit. And then the second part, A times C equal to zero, is expressing the fact that A is also a zero divisor. Can we get a, some sort of a contradiction out of this? Well, um, First of all, we don't talk about zero divisors unless we're in a commutative ring. So what I can do is I can take this equation, a, b equals one, and I can just multiply it through by c. c, a, b equals c times one, which is of course just c. But the thing is that um, a times C is supposed to equal zero. So I'm going to put a zero on the left side of that. So A times C is zero. So look what I have, C equals zero. And that is a contradiction. That is a contradiction. So you cannot be, you cannot be both a unit and a zero divisor at the same time. Let me draw a picture because this really helps. Um, well, Dr. Annie? Question? We, we can't really see the bottom part. Oh, or like, thank you for letting me know. Let me, let me move this up a little bit better for you. Is that better? Yeah. Sorry thank about you. that. That's okay. Yeah, thanks for letting me know. Yeah, so all that that says right at the bottom is that we have a contradiction because we proved that uh, C is equal to zero. But right above that, we said that C is not equal to zero. Okay, um, let me draw a picture because this picture will really help you understand how, how rings look. Here's a, a picture of a ring. <laughs> One of my really fancy pictures again, right? <laughs> now, uh, there is a zero in my ring. I'm gonna put it at the bottom. And there's also a one in my ring. I'm just gonna set that one over here on the side a little bit. And all of the units of the ring uh, forms a, like a, a group over here. I'm gonna call this U of R. These are the units of the ring. So we can kind of visualize them as this kind of little blob right here, right? Those are the multiplicatively invertible elements. And then what we just learned 
is that a zero divisor cannot be a unit. That means the zero divisors have to be over here somewhere and not intersecting with the units. So my, my zero divisors, let me just make sure that's, that you're seeing all of that. My zero divisors are disjoint from my units, okay? Notice that zero is not included as a zero divisor, um, but one, of course, is a unit. So this is kind of my picture. Um, if I have a field, how does the picture look for a field? Well, for a field, everybody is a unit except for zero. So I'm just going to cut zero out, and there's my field. My u of f, u of f there is the whole entire non-zero elements of the of the set, that's the, that's the field. Let me write that a little nicer. I know it's a little hard to see. You, the units of F, which is just F star. For a field, this is just equal to F star. Does this make sense? Um, let me just see, there was one other thing. Um, yeah, let me draw one more picture and then we're gonna be just about out of time. Let me draw the picture for Zn. Okay, I'm gonna draw another bubble here <laughs> to visualize one more thing. I'll put zero at the bottom again. I'll put one over here on the side again. Now remember, if n is prime, then we have a field, in which case this picture pretty much tells the story. But what I want you to think about is, well, what if n is not prime? So then you have all of the units. The units are here in this little bubble here. I'll just write units. And which elements are those that are going to be the units? Let's say in something like z, I mean, we've, we've, we've already learned how to do this before. Like, let's say we're in like z20 relatively prime. Yeah, just the numbers that are relatively prime to 20, right? So like 1, 1, 3, 7, 9, 11, 13, 17, 19. It's just the numbers that are relatively prime to n, right? So the units here are the numbers relatively prime to n. Okay? But what's very interesting in this case, guys, is that every other element that's not in the units and other than zero is actually a zero divisor. So the whole outside area here is completely zero divisors. There's, Dr. Ryman? We can't see the, the- Pardon, is there a question? We can't see the bubbles. Can't see the board. Let me see what I'm looking at. I can see what I'm looking at. There we go. Is that better? Yes. Yeah, sorry about that. I moved my computer a little bit closer to the to the whiteboard, and so I'm cutting things off a little bit. Sorry about that. So yeah, so in Zn, let me just reiterate what I just said. In Zn, the units are the numbers that are relatively prime to n, but everything else is a zero divisor. So the zero divisors are just simply those numbers that are not relatively prime to n. Okay, so <laughs> everything either is or isn't relatively prime to n, and it fills up uh, that whole entire space. So um, that, that is it. Okay, so I like to draw these pictures sometimes uh, to just kind of show how these, uh, how these objects actually look. Um, do I have time for anything else today? Mm. Just take a quick look at my notes. Um, well, I guess there is one last thing I can say because it takes like two seconds to say it. Does everybody agree based on what's on this board that every field is an integral domain? An integral domain has no zero divisors. But look at your picture of your field here. Everybody is a unit, right? 
everybody in a field except for zero, right? Everybody else is a unit, which means that none of those elements can be zero divisors. So this is a theorem in the, uh, in the book as well. I'm just gonna write it down and then we're gonna call it a day. Every field, I think this is theorem 3.18. Sure, but that's showing up good. Every field is an integral domain. Every field is an integral domain. Um, because in a field, everybody is a unit, and so nobody can be a zero divisor because you can't be both. Right, that's kind of the idea behind that. It's theorem 3.8. Oh, it's 3.8, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's 3.8, that's right. Theorem 3.8, thank you for correcting me on that. 3.8. Does anybody know an example, real quick before we quit, does anybody know an example of an integral domain that's not a field? Just to convince ourselves that they aren't the same concept. Something that is an integral domain. So there's no zero divisors in it. So we can't, it, it, it's got to be impossible to multiply two things together and get zero. But at the same time, not everybody is a unit. Wouldn't, I'm looking for a real easy example. Wouldn't uh, like a mod be a field? I mean, be an integral domain? Wait, never mind. Actually, could we just do the inner, like the even integers again or something like that? Um, or... You don't even need to work that hard. Even easier. An integral domain that's not a field. How about just, how about just the straight old integers? Right? In the integers, you have no zero divisors. If you, if you multiply two non-zero elements together, you get a non-zero result. So Z is definitely an integral domain, but it's not a field because most of the elements don't have multiplicative inverses. So integral domains and fields are not the same thing. You can have one that, without the other, but um, when these things are finite, they are the same. And I'll write that down and prove it later. Um, that's about all I've got uh, for now. Uh, does anybody have any questions before we call it a day here? Uh, the structure of today's office hours. Yes, I am going to uh, end this meeting right now and walk right over to, I'm going to click and open the other, the office hour Zoom uh, meeting, and I'm going to be right over there in just a few minutes. Uh, just like when I walk down to my office, it takes me a few minutes to get there, I'll be coming right over. So feel free to, to drop into my virtual office hour um because that's where i'm going to be headed and i'm going to be here thursday thursday's class is optional but if you can make it great we're going to do a couple of group works and i'm going to answer questions on the homework that you're doing that's now due on thursday um and i won't do new material on thursday i may make a video um, that's outside of the context of thursday but uh, i'll let you know about that okay thanks guys for your attention today i'll let you go um be safe out there, take care, and I'll talk to you guys all again soon. Keep watching your emails. Will do. Thank you, Dr. Annan. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.